This is from a collection of unpublished uh, short stories, basically autofiction, and because um, you'll recognize the mother in this somehow. Um, <laughs> and this is called Freud Was a Nut. Chris is going to do the male voices. <laughs> These are the best years of your life, Aunt Connie told 16-year-old Christina Falcone at the Easter dinner, her voice braying a challenge. Yeah, I know, Christina said, a big phony smile on her face. I'm having a blast. That might have been too much, she thought, the blast part. She always overdid it. It was a tightrope walk, this challenge she had charged herself with, impersonating Sandra D, an imitation of life, an old black and white movie she never missed when it was on The Late Show. Sandra had a bubbly effervescence, a cuteness that disarmed everyone that came in contact with her. Christina could wield that like a magic shield if she could ever get it right. Her mother, Rita, was also drawn to imitation of life, but more for the heart-wrenching martyr mother scenes with the long-suffering maid, Annie, and her ungrateful passing for white daughter, Sarah Jane. <laughs> this afternoon was a good time to try out the Sandra impersonation during the hours-long Easter feast. In the middle of the table was the nod to American tradition, a pink rubbery ham studded with cloves that everybody ignored. They would make sandwiches of the meat later with sharp provolone and roasted peppers and hard, crusty bread. For now, the ham was starring as a photogenic good housekeeping Easter centerpiece and nothing else. The ham was accompanied by a romaine lettuce salad, bitter greens, roast potatoes, and the real star of the show, her mother Rita's hand-cut ravioli with meatballs. A carafe of her father's Joe's homemade red wine had pride of place at the head of the table. Yeah, you think it's a joke, Connie said, correctly noting the fakeness of Christina's smile. But it's the truth. These are the best years of your life. <laughs> Christina switched off the smile. Clearly, she had to work on her Sandra D. She sighed. Everyone was still eating. It would be an hour, at least, before dessert, coffee, and the arrival of guests when she could make the escape to her room. Big Dommy shook his head. Yeah, you got a lot of growing up to do, he said. <laughs> Fixing his bloodshot eye on Christina in a Popeye squint, he took a huge glug of wine. More ravioli, Don? Rita thrust the bowl at him, hoping the pasta would absorb the wine. Big Dommy ignored her. Hey, sit up, right? He or ordered his miniature four-year-old replica Dommy boy, squirming in his seat beside Christina. You go to that wake the other night? Connie asked. The wake of Anna Bevilacqua had received more news coverage during dinner than this year's Red Sox prospects, the recent horrible weather, or the upcoming trial of Albert DeSalvo, the Boston Strangler who was shamefully Italian-American. <laughs> the drama at Carmelo's funeral home involved Anna's estranged sister Philomena, making her appearance after 40 years of not speaking to her sibling. Neither sister could remember the origin of the feud while Anna was alive. In fact, it was questionable if they even remembered they were related since they were both in their 90s, but the scene at Carmela's front parlor rivaled the last act of Madame Butterfly for those lucky enough to catch the performance. The wake was sure to be rehashed in its entirety when the neighbors arrived. The old lady looked good, Joe grunted. <laughs> I want Ray to do me when I go, Connie agreed. <laughs> Anna looked beautiful. But you see Philomene, my own. She looked like she should be in the coffin, Rita said, <laughs> spooning more ravioli onto Christina's brother's, younger brother Vinny's plate. Rita had yet to take her seat, even though the rest of them were halfway through dinner. She had a stupid look on her face, Connie explained to Big Dommy, who was working the night shift and had missed the excitement. And then, oh my God, it was terrible when they went to close the coffin. Look out, Dommy boy! Connie interrupted herself, reaching over to steady her son's tottering glass of soda. Philomene went crazy, scream. She tried to pull the sister out of the coffin, Rita reported on her way back to the kitchen for more ravioli. She took it bad, Joe said, shaking his head. <laughs> the old lady drama was taking up the entire meal. Christina's head was pounding. She thought of the witty repartee in the Oscar Wilde play she was reading. In painful contrast, this was like trying to have dinner conversation with feral beasts of the wild. She was 90, Christina blurted, her voice incredulous and high. Rita sprang from the kitchen as if shot from a giant rubber band. She topped Christina's puny outrage without breaking a sweat. She was on familiar ground like a coloratura soprano delivering the audio that had made her wor world famous. Emma, 
Rita thrust out her chin like Mussolini on the balustrade. It was her sister, her blood. You tell me now, if your brother Vinny die, you not gonna pull him out of the coffin? <laughs> Christina looked at her mother. She wished she could write to Freud and ask him to analyze Rita. He didn't leave any clues in the book she had read. What if she could just write that one sentence and ask him what he thought? That her mother was actually judging how much Christina loved her brother on the basis of whether she would someday pull him out of his theoretical coffin. Uh, it's all right. No, no, Rass. <laughs> uh, it's all right. Connie picked up the flying saucer-sized loaf of crusty bread and stood to slice off a piece. Dommy Boy's leg jittered again, shaking his glass. Connie pointed the knife at him, shrieking, Dommy Boy, if you shake that glass one more time, I'll kill you. You see this knife in my hand? Don't tempt me. <laughs> Dommy Boy stopped banging his leg. Uh, it's all right, said Nano. <laughs> his faraway voice like the faded chorus to an old-timey song. It's all right. Connie, satisfied that Dommy Boy was frozen into submission, stopped pointing the knife. Christina thought about the hotbed of neurosis that existed around her family table. Freud would be in heaven, observing this bunch. You're going to give him a castration complex on Connie, Christina ventured. Huh? Connie looked at her, still pissy about Christina's failed surrender D. Yeah, I don't want that kind of talk at the table, Joe said to his totter. Hey, pass the insulat, he said to Big Dommy. What, psychology? Freud? Christina shot back. Freud was a nut, Connie said with heat. Rita appeared behind Christina like a ghost. Always talk crazy, she said. <laughs> books. Reading dirty books. Still harping on the one time the nun caught her reading beat poetry in class. <laughs> Rita was still outraged. The nun called the house, she said for days afterwards as if the entire convent had arrived with a battering ram. Christina would not engage, she told herself. Immediately, she fired back. I told you that was poetry. Those mental midgets only want us to read about leprosy and the lives of the saints. Joe looked up from his ravioli. You're getting the best education you can get around here, he pronounced. They all say the sister schools are the best. Big Dommy agreed. Oh, that was rich, coming from Mr. Fifty's pompadour, who never read anything but the sports page in the Record American. Who's they? Mo, Larry, and Curly? Christina sneered. Joe pointed his fork at Christina. Watch your mouth, he said, his tone dangerous. Christina felt the beginning of tears pricking the back of her eyes. She blinked and cleared her throat, the old grade school tick resurfacing. Drink your tonic, honey, Connie told her toddler Denise. Denise wrapped both pudgy hands around her orange aid and slurped like a good girl. Christina was not a good girl. You're graduating next year. Then you can go to work until you get married, and I can walk you down the aisle. Great. School prison to work prison. <laughs> Wait till you get married. That's prison, Big Dommy said. <laughs> Joe chortled. Rita gave her endorsement. Ha! <laughs> she barked. Connie played along, pointing the knife at Dommy. I'll give you prison, you bastard. First, I'll make you a capon. Dommy laughed. Oh, Connie, you're giving me a castration complex. You people! <laughs> Christina was sputtering when Dommy Boy's jiggling leg finally overturned the glass of orangeade onto her lap. She leapt up. Her new jeans were soaked. You little bastard, she yelled. She jumped back from the table, almost overturning her chair, and ran upstairs, her mother yelling behind her. Good! Now I can finally wash him. <laughs> Echoed by Connie's favorite refrain. Hey, he has a mother and a father. And then very faintly, her grandfather, sounding the last reedy note to the family sonata. Hey, it's all right. <laughs> Rose rapped on Christina's bedroom door and let herself in. She had arrived with her parents for the dessert and coffee portion of the Easter feast. Christina, Christina slid her notebook under the bedspread. She was working on a play that combined the hopelessness of no exit with the elegant satire of Oscar <laughs> Wilde. <laughs> Rose was all dressed up, wearing nylons and a flimsy Easter dress that swished when she moved. She stared at Christina's crotch, which was still damp. She laughed. What'd you do, wet your pants? That little bastard dommy boy. Their eyes met. Hey, he has a mother and a father, they said together. <laughs> then giggled. It felt good to laugh, like the old days when they were easy together. Where's Danny? Christina asked. Danny was Rose's high school boyfriend, soon to be her high school graduate husband, if he could handle the finals. <laughs> he had to go to Easter dinner at the rich aunts, the one lives in Weston. 
Patsy went the movie with Billy. Mary Agnes has to spend all day at the convent visiting the nun aunt and going to a special mass. Can you picture that? No wonder she's forever in a shitty mood, said Christina. You're the one always in a shitty mood, Rose blurted. They glared at each other, the closeness of a few minutes ago gone. An uncomfortable silence developed. Rose wanted them to go downstairs and get some dessert. Christina saw how they would look standing side by side in the dining room. Rose, the first generation dream daughter, and Christina, the disgraziata, in her crotch-soaked blue jeans. <laughs> Rose's parents would direct looks of pity at Rita, and Rita would meet those glances like the Madonna Dolorata exposing her sword-pierced heart. Her father would swallow his anger, then order Christina upstairs to change, the whole scene escalating into World War III. She persuaded Rose instead to bring a plate of goodies back to her room. Rose agreed and was gone for a long time. Christina could hear loud talk and the high-pitched laughter of the women from downstairs. Finally, Rose returned. She was carrying a plate of Angeloni cookies, two forks, and a slice of ricotta pie. Your father wanted to know when I was getting married, she said. Christina shook her head, disgusted. She grabbed an Angeloni cookie, her favorite, and licked the icing. Rose smiled demurely in the mirror, rehearsing for the future. Christina changed the subject before the inevitable monologue on the wedding to be. What movie did Patsy go to? Christina wanted to see the movie version of The Group. She wondered if the instructive sex scenes in the book would be portrayed in cinemascope. <laughs> Probably not. The movie was yet to be banned by the Legion of Decency, the Catholic organization that rated films. Christina always checked the condemned list in the school library for the one she wanted to see. <laughs> She went to the sound of music. She couldn't wait, she said, even though we're all going next month. The nuns were taking the entire school to see the award-winning movie that portrayed nuns as sweet and chirpy. <laughs> the girls had all learned the entire score for chorus. She wants to see it twice? Is she a complete masochist? You hate everything, Rose said. An uncomfortable silence fell. Christina got up and turned her record player on. Hello, darkness, my old friend, <laughs> sang Simon and Garfunkel, their girlish harmonies, restoring an artificial peace. Christina sat Indian style on her bed. Rose sat beside her, the plate of sweets between them. She picked a pignoli nut off an almond macaroon, then ate the macaroon. She slipped her little kitten heels off and rubbed her feet, which looked red and swollen. I'm wearing flats for my wedding. I don't care, Rose declared. Yeah, well, I'm getting my own apartment, and I'm going to live in Boston when I graduate next year. I'm going to apply to college, Christina said offhand. She got up to flip the Simon and Garfunkel rec record to the other side. That's good, Rose said, bored, as if Christina had just announced she was on the honor roll again. Patsy wants to know if you're going to try out for cheerleading, she said. We're all going <laughs> to. That's good, Christina answered. She looked at Rose. Because I'm not. I consider that shit fun for the feeble-minded. Rose slipped on her shoes and got up smoothing her dress. I'm going downstairs, she said and left, closing the door. Christina pulled out her notebook, but she couldn't concentrate. She got up and lifted the arm of the record player and set it down in the groove for the last song of, of the album. When I Am A Rock came on, she sang along, taking a fierce pleasure in the words that seemed to be written just for her. Revitalized by singing her heart out, I have no need of friendship. Friendship causes pain. <laughs> Christina picked up her notebook and went back to her play. Joan, wearing a brown monk's cowl to symbolize her renunciation of all things worldly, sat on the bathroom floor and played her dulcimer. <laughs> Through the bathroom's door came the idiot sounds of a party of fools going on. Christina heard the toilet flush in the bathroom across the hall. The door to her room opened just as Christina, from weary habit, yelled, Knock! to no avail. Her mother stood in the doorway. You coming downstairs? Your godmother's asking for you. There was a loud burst of laughter from downstairs. Rose's infectious giggle soared above the others. I have a lot of homework, Christina said. How come Rose don't have homework? I don't know. I do, she shrugged. Her mother's temper flared. Good. Stay by, all by yourself here and take those dirty pants off on my spread. She left, slamming the door. Christina picked up her pen as if she really had homework. But she couldn't summon up that other place, the bathroom sanctuary, the calm aloofness of the girl in the monk's cowl. She looked at the door. A burst of stupid laughter seeped through the keyhole. Joan 
begins to play a magical incantation on her dulcimer, a piercing tone that opens the pipelines of the entire apartment building and unleashes a tsunami of sewage, drawing out the party of fools and delivering unto her the sounds of silence. <laughs> Joan smiles blissfully in peace at last. Christina's jeans began to feel itchy and tight. She wiggled out of them and sat on her bed, naked and free. She looked at her closet and wondered if she should put on a dress and go downstairs and join the party of fools. <laughs> uh, yeah. The last Jack Weed. <laughs> I don't know why I, was, I don't know what I was thinking in those days, how I had imagined I'd get away with it. I guess I wasn't thinking at all, or maybe I wanted to get caught, to burn it all down. The only way I could explain it is to say that I was a little crazy back then, a little desperate. Yeah, I was in my late fifties, bored with my marriage and frustrated with my job. Yeah, I was a principal, but that was the last step on the train. There was nowhere to go after that except out to pasture. It wasn't enough, not even close. Also, I was getting older. I could feel the early warnings, little aches and mysterious tingles, afternoon catnaps at the desk, trouble putting my socks on. On top of that, my dick had begun letting me down. <laughs> which was the greatest betrayal of all. <laughs> Alice told me it didn't matter to her, and I knew she was telling the truth, but it mattered to me. It mattered a lot, more than I'd like to admit. So I spoke to my doctor, and at least I got that problem fixed. I don't know what men did back then before the medication. They'd just give it all up, say goodbye to all that, because that really wasn't an option for me. <laughs> I was restless, looking for adventure, way to prove myself that the story wasn't over. And Diane was right there in front of me, not young, but a lot younger than I was, and, and pretty, and emotionally adrift, no kids, abandoned by her jerk of a, an ex-husband. I could feel the dark energy pouring out of her, a familiar desperation. We teamed up like Bonnie and Clyde and went on our little crime spree. At least we didn't kill anyone. Happy people don't do what we did. They don't go fuck, a, fuck in the principal's office in the middle of the day with a bunch of co-workers outside the door. They don't sneak off to the parking lot during uh, halftime. She threw pebbles at my window one night at two in the morning and I snuck downstairs to let her into the garage. She knelt down on the cold cement floor and gave me the best blow job of my life. My wife asleep in our bed, my daughter home from college. I don't know what would have happened if Alice hadn't gotten sick. There was a good chance that Diane and I would have been caught. Could have lost my job, lost my family. Ended my career in shame. Maybe Diane and I would have tried to make a go of it. To be a real couple in a real world instead of a pair of outlaws. Who knows? Maybe it would have worked. That's all moot. You can't have an affair while your wife, the mother of your children, is dying? I mean, some guys can. Newt Gringich did. <laughs> if I remember correctly. But uh, not me. And anyway, there was no point anymore. I had all the drama and adventure anyone needed right in my own house. The real thing. Life and death, sickness and health. Fucking your secretary is nothing compared to that. And Diane understood. She was a grown-up and a good person. The only thing that surprised me was that she stuck around the main office. I thought she might give her notice because it was awkward and, and painful for both of us having to work together after everything we'd been through to turn off all those other feelings. 
I knew it was unfair, my assumption that she was the one to go, but it made sense. There were tons of jobs for secretaries and administrative assistants out there, many of which paid a lot of money, paid a lot of money than she was making at the, at the high school. And very few openings for principals, especially for a man my age. But she was stubborn. She stayed, stayed right where she was, front desk Diane to the bitter end. And all the life went out of her. That was my fault, at least partly. Couldn't deny it. But there was nothing I could do to make it better except leave her alone as much as possible. Well. She finally outlasted me. In a few months, I'd be gone, and she'd be working for Tracy Flick. And I hope that would be a comfort for her. <laughs> <laughs>